if there's one major trend in our urban age, it has been the rise of the suburbs. Urban growth, of course, doesn't take, only, take place only in downtowns, but it takes place in the suburbs. But in the modern metropolis, there are new models for suburban growth. It is not about sprawl. It is about creating new centers, nodes, centers and nodes of urban life. These new cities, these new node cities, must be connected to the traditional downtown, to each other, and as well as the rest of the world. And, through, and they do it primarily through new digital infrastructure technologies. The remaking of the suburbs is an exciting development in our urban age. And there are some big ideas on how we are going to make it happen. And we have some excellent urban thinkers from around the world to discuss it with us now. Let me introduce our panel. First of all, John Marcioni, the mayor of the city of Richmond of Washington. Redmond. Oh, sorry. Redmond, sorry, what did I say? Richmond. I said Washington of Redmond. Well, we'll take over. He'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, he's called your honor. Here we call him your worship. So your worship, you're over there. Oh, thank you're, you. I you're like welcome. That. I'd like it. I knew you would. Joe Vaccaro, Chief Operating Officer, Ontario Home Builders Association. How are you, sir? Joe, nice to see you, sir. Uh, and uh, Andrew Frontini of Perkins and Will Canada. Andrew, Thank, thanks for nice, to nice to see you. And also Eleanor McAteer, Director, Tower Renewal. Thank you. Should be a little taller. Um, and of course, our panel, we are really lucky to have Roger Kell, Director of the City Institute of York University. Thank you, David. Roger. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Roger Kyle. I'm the director of the City Institute at York, and I have the pleasure as part of that job um, to direct a large research project uh, that's called Global Suburbanisms, in a plural, and it implies that we don't think of suburbanization as just one thing with one product and one reality. And I uh, were just about to, uh, in fact, I got the, the, the PDF file today. We're going to publish a book uh, that collects stories of some of those 50 researchers worldwide um, on what suburbanization is and what suburbs look like worldwide. And when that book comes out, I can promise you, you'll be surprised how many different ideas there are about what it means to be suburban uh, in that spirit. I want to ask the panel first, what is on their mind when they hear the word suburb or suburbanization or suburbanism as a way of life? And I'm going to start all the way on the other side of the panel with His Worship. Where well, Worship, uh, John, please. My staff will um, not like you at the end of this if I, that, this worship stuff gets us on. <laughs> um, just briefly, Redmond, Washington is the home to a few companies you might have heard of. One is Microsoft. Um, the other is Nintendo of North America. Um, that's their uh, North American headquarters. Um, they're based in Japan. Um, Redmond right now has 55,000 population and 80,000 jobs. Um, downtown Seattle is the only area that's more job dense in, in our Puget Sound region. Redmond is 100 years old, and it was a railroad stop for timber and agriculture. And it stayed that way um, through the 50s. And in the 50s and 60s, it became, I'll say, a bedroom community. And when I was a kid, I grew up in Redmond. Most dads lived, or worked, excuse me, worked in Boeing. And so three out of four houses were Boeing houses. They'd all leave at the same time. They'd all come back. But 1970, there was a major layoff in Boeing. And so you had a lot of unemployed engineers who, instead of going to Seattle to work, stayed at home and started tinkering. And we had companies like Rocket Research that built um, rockets for the Mars Lander and other technology companies. And now today, uh, Redmond um, is what maybe was referred to as a suburb, but um, Seattle has 39 cities around it that might be called suburban cities. And we have an association that we just changed our name to Puget Sound Cities Association. We uh, took away the suburban because we each have our own urban qualities. And instead of a, being a commuter town, we're working for Redmond to become a complete town, a city you can live all your life. So suburban, um, I think is a, the term is fading in Seattle. 
Thank you, John. Joe. Well, in my capacity at the Ontario Home Builders, I guess I have the opportunity to, uh, to work with developers and planners and councils um, who have once upon a time viewed themselves as suburban, but I think that definition has evolved and we're now more into a space of what we refer to as complete communities. Um, taking that uh, urban forum or that form that's been created over bedroom communities and adding a uh, city center. And um, I think the residents in those communities are also going through a cultural shift as to what suburban living is about now. And they're also looking for new options, new opportunities, um, be them cultural amenities um, or other items that you know, keep them connected to their city uh, versus you know, traveling downtown to find those opportunities for themselves and their families. So, um, I think the definition of suburban, like many things, has evolved over time. And I think that that definition really is, um, or that form really is uh, changing as we collectively sort of determine what we want out of our lifestyles. So once upon a time, that suburban lifestyle of, as you were saying, get up in the morning, make your way downtown, come back and enjoy the weekend with the family. That's changed now where I think uh, we're all looking for a little more live, uh, live, work, play. And I think the suburbs are responding that way. And, Certainly in Ontario, the provincial government has you know, created a framework by which uh, there's an expectation that you know, the once defined suburban bedroom community is uh, required and needed to sort of create a city center and create more of that collective experience. Thank you, Joe. Andrew. Well, I'm an architect with Perkins and Well, and a big part of our practice is public buildings, libraries, recreational centers. And we have been designing those over the past decade in what you traditionally call a suburban realm. So um, I've had the opportunity to visit many, uh, work in many of the municipalities that surround Toronto, uh, from east to west and up north, and, and to be part of the process by which they implement public infrastructure and create public space. And you know, it's interesting to watch uh, the challenges they face, how they fund these projects, and, and the effect that these projects have on, on communities. And I would say we've been in the fortunate position to create uh, census work, to work to create a sense of place a public realm where previously one didn't exist, and, and these these buildings have become kind of catalysts uh, for the kind of ag aggregate neighborhood uh, that begins to form around them. So, an interesting position to view the transformation of the suburbs. And and one thing I will say is, in working in a variety of municipalities, is despite perhaps a an architectural monoculture or a kind of a planning monoculture that you know is pervasive. They're, they're quite distinct places and, and the kind of communities that live in them and the landforms that they either erase or negotiate are a big part of that. Thank you, Andrew. Another perspective, Eleanor. Um, thank you. I um, work with the Tower Renewal Project at the City of Toronto <coughs> and it is focused on the 1,200 apartment buildings that we have in the city and those are the rental apartment buildings that were constructed in the 60s and 70s. Most of those buildings were constructed in response to a huge population increase in the city. And so the planners of the day had to figure out how to deal with a 50% increase in population almost overnight. And their solution was to come up with what were our first planned communities. And these planned communities had a kind of central area that had shops and uh, services and places to work. They had some commercial often. And then ringing around that were apartment buildings. And that's the way they started being built. Um, very often there was also some manufacturing and other kinds of industry nearby. But then just more and more apartment buildings got built, um, generally on, on more major streets, kind of filling in the, the fabric in our what we now call our inner suburbs in Scarborough and North York and Etobicoke. And so they, they worked uh, really well to house a lot of people in a pretty affordable way. And they still, still do that. Um, but one thing that's changed is a lot of the manufacturing um, jobs are no longer um, available. Uh, we certainly have uh, very increased uh, immigration. So these are really our arrival cities where people who come to Toronto um, that's where they, they go to live. One of the great things I get to do in my job is uh, meet people who tell me stories about when they were 10 years old and their family came to Toronto. Um, you know, this is the apartment building they lived in and the, their lives there and the schools they went to and the shops. And even today, although we know and uh, 
we know very strongly that in our those inner suburbs that ring around the, the central city, that there's great uh, disparity in income, um, that there's a lot of people um, who are struggling, and a lot of that is um, newcomers and um, our immigrant population. A lot of people who have a lot of skills, who have education and knowledge and experience from other areas of the world, but have not been able to um, really apply uh, that as, as much as they want to and could. And so we have a lot of challenges, but we also know from a United Way vertical poverty uh, survey that the people who live there like it there. Um, sure, there are things they'd like to see improved, but it's their home and it's a, a good place for their families uh, to be. They would just like to have more opportunity and, and have some aspects of their neighborhoods uh, improve. Thank you, Eleanor. I will come back to the, these latter issues of arrival city and the social diversity in a later round of questions, but I want to go back to something which you just noted, which is in the inner suburbs there is this uh, growing economic disparity between jobs that disappeared and people who arrive. Uh, so there were certain industries that used the suburbs used to be associated with, um, assembly plants for cars, um, van plant in Scarborough. Um, these kinds of things were almost expected and actually a place like the Golden Mile Scarborough was built that way. Um, that's not the case anymore. These kinds of industries are now disappearing, uh, not only Toronto itself, but also the inner suburbs and now also the outer suburbs are losing some of the manufacturing industries that it used to have. Instead, we're being told, and I want to ask the panelists whether that is true and what about it is true, uh, new kinds of sectors are now making their home in the suburbs. Uh, one of them that is often talked about, apart from logistics, like an airport is obviously in most cities. Some people want an airport in the inner city, but other people have airports mostly in the outer city. Um, that's logistics, warehousing, these sort of things. But one of the things that is being talked about a lot is high tech. Um, and uh, high tech companies, we think of Silicon Valley, for example, uh, typically tended to be um, in, in suburban or exurban environments. So John, uh, you already spoke about the profile of your city. It seems to be the case in your, in your city. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, I think it's a number of factors. Um, one is those board engineers from Boeing that laid off start building stuff, but also the education system. Most people chose to live in Redmond back then because they had a good education system. Um, and that made it attractive later to recruit people. Uh, we have a university called DigiPen, which is a gaming university, one of the premier gaming universities in the world. And at first it was dismissed as games. Well, that gaming technology runs drones, runs um, a number of um, machines um, that are be way beyond um, games. Uh, so I think um, high tech is created by uh, having a creative class that interacts and um, having that strong engineering culture already just led to the math and sciences. Thank you, Joe. Well, I think it's a, it's a challenge because, you know, from our perspective as home builders, developers, and commercial developers, uh, it's really a partnership with the municipalities. They're going to identify um, sectors that they want to attract to the municipalities, and they do it through a number of economic development tools, um, be them tax incentives or what have you. Um, but part of the package, part of the appeal to bring in a a tech company, or any company for that sector, or for that for that matter, is the um, associated and complementary pieces that go with it. So if you're looking to attract um, a tech company to your area, the company coming in is going to be looking for the sort of housing and lifestyle that will r retain their employees, especially if they need to move key employees from one area of the world to another area of the world. Is this going to be a city that they're going to enjoy, that their families are going to enjoy? It's part of the sort of the package. So. From our perspective, it's, it's a question of the municipalities setting out their economic development plan. And then within that, they have to also take into account what the city offers those key employees. And you know, there's always that, that sort of joke that a developer will, will say is that you know, when you look to where you're going to you know, develop your next community, high rise, low rise, what have you, the first question you ask yourself is where are the jobs? And then can people make it from their workplace to their home in a reasonable amount of time? And that's where transit becomes so important. 
Um, and so I think that's, that's sort of part of the pitch to bring in those sectors. Well, there, there seem to be two schools of uh, thought out there, and you know, I'm caricaturizing that a little bit, but one school of thought which has already been cited, Richard Florida's, is that people want walkable neighborhoods, <coughs> excuse me, and they want street cafes, and they want density, and rubbing shoulders with other talent. Other people say, don't you know those geeks that create the games? They shop at Winners, and they walk around in sneakers that they buy cheap in a, in a sporting goods store, and they don't, couldn't care less about uh, French movies and, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, hipster bands. Uh, so the question is, of course, how do you design uh, for those polarities in mm -hmm. what we think is the creative class? Andrew? Well, I, I, you know, I, I read the Wall Street Journal, that Richard Florida's article about the kind of morphing tech industry, going away from an engineering-focused uh, industry, uh, not necessarily departing, but a new branch of it is the kind of soft high-tech, which is all about the creation of apps or, or social media, and that is a kind of slight, perhaps a slightly a kind of splinter class, of, and they are perhaps more drawn to an urban lifestyle. And, and, and I also think that, you know, if you've seen the movie The Revenge of the Nerds, the stereotype of, uh, of the kind of, you know, kind of intellectual te tech head that, that is in fact anti-social, I mean, those, that antisocial class is in fact the dominant class now, so, and you do see them occupying the urban landscape and, and quite aggressively. So, you know, the hipster band and the independent coffee and the guy who's developing an app in, above a storefront, I mean, they, they all, those can all happen uh, in, in a conventional, what we think of a downtown uh, urban setting. But I think also, and I think what, what it draws is that the, the suburban municipalities as they start to create intensity around these nodes, they're looking to, in some way, emulate or create their own version of those conditions mm -hmm. of density. And uh, it's a density of experience, whether that's cultural, economic, social. Interesting. Yeah. Eleanor, is there high tech in the towers? I, I, absolutely there is. Um, the towers themselves aren't very high tech, but certainly an awful lot of the people who live there, um, really this is a tremendous opportunity. One of the things the City of Toronto has is a huge academic sector, particularly post-secondary, uh, and we have, I think, about 40 campuses throughout the city. And these are really um, um, elements of the city that, that keep on giving because it attracts people to the city. Um, it provides us with a very educated um, group of people in the city. And then a lot of the people who, who come for school stay. And so it's being able to, to capture the, the entrepreneurial spirit that a lot of people have. And one of the things that we're trying to do in the inner suburbs is um, increase the range of, of commercial activities that can happen um, by allowing, and so that thereby allowing a lot of entrepreneurial spirit to be able to be realized and people be able to um, do those kinds of businesses and, and really start to grow very organically, um, what you know might eventually be a, a Microsoft. Thank you. I would like to take us a little bit deeper into that uh, topic, and I want to come back to what you earlier said about the social disparities in the inner suburbs. Would we also know, and I know that the United Way of York Region, for example, is now looking into homelessness disparities in the outer suburbs also. There is now the same kind of study that was done uh, for a vertical poverty by the United Way in the 416 is now also done in the 905. And we begin to understand that it's not all uh, happiness out there uh, in terms of the social disparities. So what I'd be interested in is for all of you to comment a little bit about how we can use all that knowledge, the high tech, the growing uh, immigrant uh, knowledge base that we have in those suburban, ex-urban environments. And that's a particular, of course, a Toronto-centric view. Uh, in a way, John, uh, but to use those uh, capacities uh, to do something about the social disparities that we're beginning to face, and this time I would, would like to start with Eleanor. Well, we um, certainly know that so many uh, people um, are not well connected to their, uh, their city and the services that they need are not being provided where they need to be provided. So it's really a, a role that the municipality can play to provide a way of reaching out to people um, to understand better what their needs are, 
to have that kind of interactive opportunity. Right now, people, in particularly in the inner suburbs, are disconnected, um, both physically from the decision makers downtown very often, but also because they do not have uh, the opportunities to, to have their voices heard. So social media in particular is a real opportunity for the city. We at first thought that because people of low income, um, they may not have um, uh, phones and, and, and computers, but in fact, uh, people in the inner suburbs are very well uh, connected. So it, there is absolutely an opportunity to improve our service level by using those kinds of technologies. Great, thanks, Andrew. So, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to look at it from the perspective of, you know, of isolation. You talked about disconnectedness. And, you know, being an architect, I will tend to veer towards the physical uh, fabric of this. But, there, I mean, I think there's a technological tie-in. I mean, one thing that we've noticed uh, in, in various municipalities is that the physical structure of the city as it's been built, and I speak about the single family home, uh, which will be a, a kind of in a cluster around certain social amenities or, or commercial activities, um, you know, it's, it's really, its mode of inhabitation has really changed significantly. And I, I'd say in very broad strokes, two, two, kind, of, two kind of phenomena. One is, that, is the sort of empty nester, so the, 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 an architectural typology built in, you know, in, in the car age for the nuclear family. Well, the family's gone. You've got two, uh, you know, a boomer copper uh, un kind of under occupying that building, and that will be the have suburb. And the have not suburb is perhaps a, a product of uh, of recent immigration patterns. And you might have uh, large concentrated communities occupying those buildings in a completely different way. So instead of a single family house having a single family, it might have three families. It might have three families and a family business. It might have a, a kind of extended family grouping or it might have a sponsorship grouping where someone is sponsoring someone to come to this country and they move into a single family house. So witnessing those, you know, the kind of, the intent of the building type uh, being taken over in a new way, but, but somehow something about the structure of the neighborhood is, is uh, really uh, promoting an isolation, especially for women and children. And so, uh, you know, one, uh, the introduction of public buildings into that structure, introduction of density or networks of physical connection help. I mean, when we build a community center in those spaces, all of a sudden people emerge from the basement, as it were, and they're able to begin to create a, a community where they weren't before because there aren't sidewalks, public places. And then again, when those facilities are built, they um, often embark on a quite aggressive social media campaign because that is a way to get people aware of the physical facility. But I think ultimately the actual community uh, that's going to promote a healthy city is going to happen in a physical space. Thank you. So social innovation, physical design. Joe. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this topic from a perspective of affordability. And, you know, if, if 50, 60 percent of your income is going to uh, your housing needs, um, then you're sort of trapped in a situation where you can never really get out of that situation. So for, you know, representing uh, market-based builders and developers, um, they, you know, the market and the, the cost structure of housing and commercial opportunities um, is impacted by things like uh, zoning decisions by the municipality, um, government imposed charges, et cetera, et cetera, the cost of construction. It's all part of um, the end use product and the cost of it. And so from a market position, um, as, we, as our members are working through zoning and the rest of it, and they finally bring a community on stream, um, it's really market driven. And I say that because if the market finds itself in a much more affordable space, then that means there are more opportunities for people who are struggling to find housing options uh, to maybe move out of, as we call the housing ladder, move out of one set of housing options to another set of housing options. Um, and so people are locked in in terms of what they can afford. And then you know that extension being, as I said about the developer, where, where are people working? So they're locked into where they're working and they're locked into what they can afford. And then you have that, the need for the, the connection and their ability to participate in beyond just simply work and home life um, gets chewed up by that travel, gets chewed up by making those two pieces work. Um, I mean, so just from our perspective, you know, we, we always go back to the affordability question. Uh, and if the market is creating affordable housing options for people at different income levels, then that's the first step in them having options. Mm -hmm. And within those options, they now have choice. And um, when affordability is challenged, people don't have choice. They're locked into where they can live. 
and they're usually locked into where they can work, and the rest of it sort of falls to the wayside. Thanks. John? A few things. Technology um, helps our social service agencies coordinate with each other because it really takes wraparound services to, um, to get someone out of poverty. If someone's hungry or jobless, they might be illiterate also. And, and having these services work together um, allows technology. Technology helps us do that. Being digitally connected is important in our community. It's the only way you're going to probably find a job. Um, our social service agencies um, are able to take uh, phones and, and our libraries are open for digitally connecting um, people who are disconnected. And then in terms of housing, um, we have inclusionary housing in that 10% of all new housing constructed needs to be affordable housing. And um, that's managed through a, a, a collective of cities on the east side, uh, but also allowing innovative housing. Um, so we have housing choices from the studio apartment to the 3,000 square foot house. Mm -hmm. And that allows the market to work on that level. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question I ask for brief answers. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. In Toronto, maybe more than other cities, we have these two iconic housing forms, the bungalow and the high-rise building. And, and as an arrival city of the old kind, where people moved into the inner cities first, the bungalow and the high-rise building were fantastic because they were boxes that could be filled. And if you want to see the most diverse place on Earth, uh, it's not Nathan Phillips Square, it's not the um, um, BMO Field, it's um, IKEA, where people go to fill those boxes. <laughs> but in the suburbs, in those <coughs> newer suburbs, we're now building completely different kinds of boxes. And they are filled by different kinds of people than the ones that moved into those earlier boxes. Mm -hmm. There is now an interesting um, <laughs> um, land use conflict in Brampton where one family wants to expand the family house on a street because they want to live as an extended family. And that causes some conflict around the standards of what is suburban. So we are now a city of immigrants. And in the city of, and I want to point out that I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that with a Scottish last name, name a German, and three Italians, uh, we're not actually representing the new populations in the suburbs. We're the ones who lived in those boxes. Uh, so we are actually talking about other people who are now moving in. I just want, to, want you to know that we are aware of that. Uh, but given that new situation, what do you think is the greatest challenge if we have these new immigrant populations, how do those suburbs now grow the way East York here in Toronto or some of the tower neighborhoods have grown with time and become more flexible kinds of neighborhoods? What can we do about those new subdivisions that are now being built? How do they look in 25 years? Short, please. And I start with Joe and go this way and come back to John. Well, I think the new opportunities in, in, in the suburbs is infill opportunities. Oppor opportunities of looking for where transit and infrastructure is already in place, social services and social institutions are in place, schools and such, and looking for ways of completing those areas with new housing options. Be them uh, six story uh, structures versus you know 17 story structures. So, and I think that requires a great deal of coordination and work and, and goodwill between the municipality because they'll have existing residents who have their own concerns, as you said, in Brampton, about bringing in <clears throat> a new form of, of housing or commercial space in an existing area. So I, I think the greatest opportunities in the suburbs to complete their communities is really infill and taking advantage of existing transit and infrastructure. Thanks, Andrew. I think the challenge is the, is, is the missing scale of housing development. You see the infill, infill projects happening at a very high density, mm -hmm. 20 stories, 30 stories, 40 story condo tower. That's one kind of living. We see the traditional suburban format as a single family house. Great reluctance in the Canadian development industry to build anything that mediates between those two scales. And I think the ultimate health uh, and development of a, of a denser city centre is going to come through a fairly consistent application of a, of, of a kind of high density at a medium height mm -hmm. where you have more in, intense urban fabric, greater interactions, greater diversity and finer grain. Brian Tucky, 
notice, uh, you know, um, promised us something for next week, so we'll have to wait and see what he has in, in <laughs> store. I think yeah. I know what he has in store. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, I, I echo that, and certainly with our apartment sites, they're often known as tower in the park, mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. lots of open space around them, and um, it, it kind of looks nice in, a, in an artist's rendering, but the reality and how they work is not that great. Um, one of the things that people who live there would like to see is that more diversity in, in housing choice. If they were going to be moving, what would be they be moving to? And also it would just complete the fabric of the neighborhood, of the streets. Thanks. John? Um, culturally and religious connections, just connecting the new groups to the greater community, um, is one way, and we do have a number of cultural um, fairs and, and so forth in Redmond, but also religiously. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have a Hindu temple. We didn't have mosques. Um, these are something new to the area. And then the other thing, at least particularly in the Indian culture, is they tend to bring their parents with them. So having um, mother-in-law apartments and things of that nature where the whole family can come and you have those different generations living next to each other. Um, helps too. Thank you. I'm just wondering whether, which also was true for the Germans and the Italians a generation ago, whether the Indian family might be surprised that the kids move out to the downtown condos at some point and the house is empty. <laughs> That's the challenge we have. Um, but I now would, even though I don't see anything, I would like to open <laughs> it up to the, the floor. Yes, please. Give the yeah, microphone, right, coming right here. Hi, my name is Astra Berg, I'm an architect. I just wanted to know, how do you intensify established neighborhoods that have been in the, I don't like the word inner suburb, I think we're part of the city of Toronto and I think we're discriminating. Uh, <laughs> but I think that with the, how do you transform a neighborhood from a single family to a multi-complex area because what we find, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. single house, high rise, there's nothing in between. And what kind of ways would you encourage the city government to create this new growth, which is not happening in Toronto right now and in, in the three other cities that we have in Toronto? Sounds like a question you want to answer. Well, uh, we, we have uh, got direction from City Council to look at, at just that question. We started off with new zoning that just went through last month, and it's the, a new zone category called RAC zoning, residential, apartment, commercial. So it will allow a wider range of uses on apartment sites at a small scale. Um, the next step is to look at the next tier, and that is actual infill on these sites. And not all sites will be appropriate for infill, but a lot of the conclusions we've come to is because we've looked back over the last uh, 15 years or so, and about 60 sites have had infill, have um, rezoning applications in for infill. So there's a, a lot of experience to look at there. So that's about 5% of the apartment sites have already experienced some of this. And there's a lot of good examples, and there's a lot of examples that maybe um, we, we learn more from, but looking at those, how to make it work, because there is a demand and there is a, is, there is a desire for change, but people want uh, the change that they want. Thanks. I was going to say, in pinpoint an area, a small area to create critical mass and plan for, you know, start with three blocks and as it becomes more dense, you can spread that to eight or ten or whatever. But people want to see proof of concept. And then once the proof of concept works, then they start saying, well, I want a restaurant I can walk to. I want this I can walk to. And it becomes uh, more acceptable. Interesting, Joe. I guess what I would say is um, it is a public planning process, right? And so in that public planning process, the reality is that you will have existing residents who will be opposed to a change in their community. And so this becomes a struggle at that level. And you know what we like to say is you, just, you have to make it happen. If you want it to happen, you have to make it happen. So Tower Renewal is a great program. It's a great concept, but there are challenges. Among the challenges is that there, there is no pre-zoning in that program. You actually have to fight for another zoning and go through that entire process again. Um, and so that's a challenge for a developer who maybe owns the rental units. He's got lots of land and great ideas to bring forward. But the struggle to work through the planning process and also the struggle sometimes from the political people involved, the local councillors, who may not give you their endorsement or support, um, 
because they're dealing with their own political reality. So um, I guess my answer to you is that it is a public planning process. And in that public planning process, there are many, many conflicts. Um, but you need political leadership to say, we are gonna move in this direction. And you need to have, you know, from the market side, from the developer perspective, someone who is gonna work with and respect to a point um, what can be brought forward. And lastly, it goes back to affordability. There's no point in bringing forward projects or ideas that at the end of the day when the developer puts it all together and determines what the market price is going to be, if it's not gonna work for that marketplace, it's simply not gonna happen. So ultimately, as I say to my architecture, my, my friends in the architecture world, you can design the most beautiful building you want, but if the developer can't make it work in that market, it just stays on the page. And that's the struggle that we deal with. Andrew, do you wanna add? I would just say that, I mean, it would be, um, to have, have, plan, have, have master plans in place uh, at the municipal level that, that provide more guidance for development. Mm -hmm. And I think we're very reluctant to do that, uh, particularly in the city of Toronto. It, it's not particularly prescriptive. Right. And uh, it's so- beginning to change though. That is beginning it? to change. And we're looking, at, you know, we are looking to a new era. I guess you, you'll want to see it, 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 uh, it fulfill itself. But again, that disparity of scale is, is when, when someone can, can maximize density, why would they opt for, uh, or when they think of a, uh, a neighborhood uh, as a single lot. I mean, that's the problem. He's all, it's always about a developer and, and a property. And it's a capitalist society. So I, you don't, it's really, it really goes against the grain to suggest that you should not develop it to its ultimate potential. But it has to be put in the context of all of the other lots. And I do recall the Main Streets Initiative in the, uh, mm -hmm. the right. mid-90s where it was about creating a certain intensity on transit corridors. It happened in piecemeal, but uh, really, you know, Lawrence Avenue was a great example. Still a, a site, uh, a, an arterial road with, you know, minimal travel, uh, transit connectivity, and still really under density. And, it, you know, it's part of the inner, I guess what we call the inner suburb. And you look at that, and there's a real opportunity to make that something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there is, the planning uh, momentum hasn't been yep. maintained. Good example. Thank yes, thank you. I saw a gentleman down here. We actually have a question up here. Oh, you do? Yep. Yeah, it's uh, Robert. I have to be very, very honest. I feel a bit of a disconnect. Um, I kind of feel what a lot of what I'm hearing I would interpret as manipulation and greed because one of the most basic things in life is to have a place to live. And you do want to make it affordable. Now, the problem I have, you look at what happened down in the U.S., and I'm not going to make any long speeches, uh, but, uh, but I'm hearing about this housing development and infill and all that. That would be great if it was only in the city of Toronto. But I have a daughter that lives in, Auto in, in Aurora, a son that lives in Whitby, and everywhere I go, all that great farmland is gone. And they are not small houses replacing that farmland. They're huge houses. The money is out there. You talk about affordability and that, that disconnect between the rich and the poor and unfortunately, it's, it's not getting better. And what I'm hearing, I think it's going to get worse. So how do you address that? Does anybody have a good, fast answer on this? Otherwise, we can just leave it as a comment, because we all Well, have I won't leave it as a comment, so let me say my part. Um, I guess the struggle here is, if we start with the reality that 100,000 people make their way to this region every single year, and we layer on top of that, provinces places a growth plan and what the requirements of policy do, um, then that is the form by which all these items get brought forward. And further to that, um, whether we're speaking about farmland or we're speaking about um, intensification sites, it is still a public planning process. And so in that process, communities, municipal leadership have an opportunity to put forward their positions, <coughs> speak to their issues, and you work through that public process, and all these decisions are ultimately publicly made within conformity of all of the magnitude of legislation and regulations that we have in place. So I hear the concern about you know, um, the sprawl out, but my challenge back to you is, in Ontario, we have a Places to Grow Act, we have a plan. So can you have sprawl within a, a growth plan? We have a growth plan. So we know where development will go, and further to that, the new forms of de development that are being challenged upon the development community is greater intensification, greater transit. So put all these things together. I think we need to start looking forward and not backwards. And okay. within that, we need to understand that communities work best when you also have the social infrastructure that makes it work. Okay. We have the growth plan, but we also have the green, the, the green belt. 
And so in this particular jurisdiction, we have those two, and they regulate each other. And the Greenbelt, to some degree, is a boundary to that kind of sprawl. We'll see how it works. But right now, this is the juristic, this, the, this is the reality in which we live in this particular jurisdiction. We are running out of time. I, okay. I will just have to ask you one more question. Very quickly, <laughs> thinking not from the inside out, which we continue to do when we talk about the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Think for 10 seconds each, 15 seconds each, from the outside in. What is the greatest challenge for the next generation? Starting with John. Uh, connecting the suburbs. We have, we have Toronto surrounded, and uh, we'll take it by force. No. Um, <laughs> we have Seattle surrounded, and we'll take it by force. Very good. Thank you. I think connecting the suburbs to each other. I think we spent a lot of time looking at how to connect the suburbs to Toronto, but as someone who is from the suburbs originally, um, connecting those suburbs to each other, especially when you understand that employment is, you may be living in Mississauga, but you may be working in Brampton or Markham, and how are we connecting those pieces? That's the piece that I think we keep avoiding that Very important, important conversation. Thank you. Andrew. I would say that the, the, uh, the basic ac economic premise of the suburbs will be challenged in the coming decades. Uh, of uh, Low tax base attracting people to one of many municipalities, that's done through development charges which subsidize public infrastructure. When you don't have any more land, you have to find new ways to entice development. You have to raise taxes. So how are each of these suburban communities going to preserve their most precious asset, which is the land which attracts developers? Excellent. I would say revitalizing our, our existing um, communities, um, leveraging the uh, density that we have there and all the other uh, great attributes, uh, natural attributes, cultural attributes, and, and really figuring out how to revitalize them one by one by one by one. One by one by one by one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists.